So we are going to start our final panel before lunch. Um, so my name is Emma Moles. Um, I'm going to be moderating this panel. Um, we have a fairly diverse group of folks up here as far as experience goes. Um, so this, this panel is uh, entitled Professional Development. Um, I've spoken with each of our panelists and that sort of means a little bit different things to each of them and that also will mean something different to you. So I do ask that as each presenter goes, that when we think about at the end what kind of questions to ask, we can see how each of their experiences kind of tie together in ways that we might have not thought of before. Um, so from that, we're going to go straight into our panelists. All right, so I would like to first introduce Marilyn Billings. Um, Marilyn has done a fantastic job of stepping in on this panel um, due to some conflicts uh, with prior folks. So please welcome uh, Marilyn Billings from University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she is a scholarly communication and special initiatives librarian. Thank you all. Thank you. And I want to do a shout out to the person I'm filling in for, uh, if I might. Her name is Mary Burgess from the BC campus. We've heard a lot about uh, University of British Columbia today. And she was uh, commenting that she was so excited to be doing this kind of work. Um, it, the greatest thing is working on open enables her to live her values through her work. And she believes education is a right and that everyone should have equal access to education. So I think we're all there. And I just wanted to say that. Okay, this is supposed to, whoops, it advanced twice, all right. So many of you have probably seen this slide and it really substantiates things that other speakers here have said today already. Um, I just wanna comment that we did a presentation to our faculty senate uh, a couple years ago now and we brought these tables to the, to the faculty senate. And I think that's a great venue to start talking about open education and the power that it brings. Um, five figure student debt load, UMass is, uh, supposedly known for its affordability and you know huge amounts of money goes to textbooks every year so when I showed the graph that you see with the textbook cost being the blue line 812 percent increase over uh, 30 years the red line was medical expenses and our provost was from the medical field the, he just gasped and said, you know what can we do so that was that was a really help great help for us getting started here is some of the work that's been done showing the various costs that students incur in their uh, college career. The one to highlight is that really small one, but that's a really significant one. That's the cost that we can actually do something about, which is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the cost of the textbooks and other supplies that the students have. This slide was actually presented to our board of trustees last year so that they can start thinking about some of these kind of issues. So open education, we heard about this yesterday, the various rights to retain, to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute our works. Um, so uh, we really believe in that, and we talk to the faculty about what all of those particular aspects mean. And we also talk to them uh, when we have workshops for them in a course of our particular grant cycle, what OERs include. The curriculum materials, such as their syllabi, course modules, anything new they want to create along that line, other kinds of textbooks, assignments, learning objects. We really want them to think outside the box. Various collections of things, even from our library collections or other openly available sites and various tools they might be interested in uh, coming up with to interact in a more active way with the students. So this slide is one that talks about how aware faculty are about open education resources and we have tons of work to do as be has become evident here this, these couple of days. Uh, the one that's really most significant is the big gray bar, uh, part of the circle, most faculty not being aware of open education resources. So we're going to be tackling that. And then just to back up what Brady said just a little while ago, um, we did a survey of our students based on our experience and what are the decisions that they're making? Not just what the national averages were, but what were UMass students doing? 53% said they never purchased the book because it was too expensive. They didn't take a class 
because it was, uh, the class, the textbook was too expensive, 23%. Taken different class, textbook was too expensive. Some have even changed the trajectory of where they want to go with their career just because of the cost of textbooks. Another thing that's a real big concern for us that we've been finding is that students are starting to use their financial aid dollars to pay for textbooks. You know, 6%, what percent interest rate on this content? And they're paying over, what, a decade for that increased cost of textbooks. That is just a shame. I just, I can't even come up with words to express how awful that is. So let's take a look at how UMass Amherst started addressing this particular problem. We're a public land grant university, publicly funded. In fiscal year 2011, we started getting significant budget cuts. So we had to increase the student tuition and fees. And we're hearing from the students how high the cost of textbooks is going in addition to now their increased tuition and fees. So we decided we needed to come up with some kind of a solution. And I think we're probably one of the oldest programs out there because we started in the fall of 2011. We called it the Open Education Initiative. And it's uh, got several different prongs to it. It's to create, um, encourage faculty to possibly create new teaching materials and models. They, or they can pick the use of existing open, freely available with permission information resources that support their student learning. The use of library subscription materials, or we can talk to them about developing open technologies. So how are we doing all of this? Uh, we decided we had to start partnering with other people on the campus. Uh, so we have people in our information technology group. Those are the folks that support the learning management system. We have people in our TEFT department, teaching excellence and faculty development. They're the instructional designers, the people who work with the faculty on the syllabus. Um, and they bring huge different types of skill sets, each one of them, to the libraries. Within the libraries, we have our liaison librarians and then folks in my shop that uh, really administer the grants. So what are these little grants? They're um, small $1,000 grants for faculty who are looking for alternatives to high cost textbooks. Um, they, this is the kind of information that they need to fill out. We try to make it really simple and easy for them to do. It's a $2,500 grant if they want to, if they have a class that's over 200 students. That's just a quick review of the whole thing because I want to get into where this goes in our professions. So what are some of the faculty success stories that we've heard? I'm going to flip through these quickly so you see them all. Um, Carlos is in the veterinary animal sciences. He created a video. He, he teaches of, um, how to inoculate horses. And <laughs> no textbook for this. So he said, you know, the easiest way for me to teach students is to do this interactive thing. We don't have enough horses to inoculate all the time. So we're going to create this little video. And it's been used many, many times, uh, saving over uh, $7,600 just in the small amount of time that he's been using that. Billy Ann Kang is in women's studies. I like to provide some examples from humanities. Uh, and she has created a whole new textbook in women and gender studies. There really haven't been the content out there for uh, teaching those kind of courses. So saving well over $8,000. It's been downloaded in our repository over 3,600 times. Gets a lot of use. Hossein Pisronik, he's my little, uh, I don't know, poster man. Uh, <laughs> he's in um, engineering. And some people might think that people, folks in engineering might not be interested in open education. Well, he took his small uh, $1,000 grant and created a website, an interactive book, interactive quizzes, also has a book that's available on Amazon as a print copy, uh, has used it in zillions of his classes. People all over the world have gotten in touch with him to ask permission to use it, although it's a CC BY license. And uh, he's just, you know, it's just really, that's just such a charming story. And he'd be a, a great person to bring in for a talk at some point. So like some of the others have been talking about, 
Student involvement and engagement is really key. Uh, we've been working with our student government association, with our student trustee, um, with the Mass Perg group, and uh, others on campus for a couple of years now. Before that, it seemed like, you know, we were going along, we were saving money. We got up to close to a million dollars and savings for the students. But this campaign has been really totally awesome. It's been on Facebook. Um, and they just shout out about the, you know, the value of working with the librarians on our open education initiative. They passed a resolution in the SGA and uh, just recently went to the provost with it and said, what are you going to do? The provost calls me and says, Marilyn, what are we going to do? So <laughs> we, uh, she knew about this, but she's relatively new to the campus, and so you give her that. And so uh, we met with her, and uh, we agreed that we were going to maybe double the size of our grants. And so she just sent an announcement out this morning to all of the faculty in all of our gen ed programs and asked them to participate in this, in this work. So I am, I'm wicked psyched about this. I said to the chancellor the other day when I saw him, I said, you know, I really want to get all of our gen eds flipped over to open ed by fall of 16. And I said, oh, maybe 17. So that's the goal. Not all of them might fit with open ed, but maybe we can create some new ones for those that don't have content. But there we are. It's staking the ground. <laughs> So possibilities with open education resources. We've got the Spark, you know, back in the beginning, I thought, you know, the Spark is great. You know, we've got all this open advocacy. We've got all these partnerships going on. It's open access. It's our repository. It's open data. Where does this education thing fit in here? I just thought, you know, my plate is so full with all of the, the rest of this. And then it just, talking with different people and coming to various uh, events that occur, it just made sense. Social justice wise for our university, for our land grant mission, for everything, it really fit right into the middle of it. So now it was like all of a sudden I'm where uh, our department is like all things open, whatever it is and whatever's coming down the road, that's the theme. <laughs> um, fitting you in with the university and college missions is really key and I can look at what our strategic plan is for the university and say here's where uh, this piece of all of this fits in. To the, to the pie. We're engaged in a lot of things with the public, with um, commitment to teaching and, and learning, to student success, and that social justice mission is just huge at our university. There's also been a lot of interest in inter-office and cross-disciplinary research and activities, and so this is where uh, our work is also turning out to be very valuable. <coughs> We started to build really excellent relationships, even better than when we first started uh, doing the open ed with the, um, the Tefti group, the teaching and learning group. I would highly recommend them as really key partners. We also have another group that deals with our continuing education and they're finding excellent professional development opportunities for themselves. In fact, the uh, continuing ed folks asked me for uh, kind of a job description for a person to work with them on the open education kind of work. So outside of libraries, this, this kind of work is having a difference in the way career paths are developing. So when we take a look at what we're doing as librarians, being one, um, what kind of career trajectories are we seeing? So just this past June, I was able to hire an open education librarian. You see a few job descriptions for those kind of um, positions out there at this point. So I'd stay on the lookout for those. Uh, we're also engaged in the framework for all of liaison responsibilities. And they're now including uh, knowledge of open education resources as well as open access and those kind of things. So there's, there's a change and a shift in what our librarians are expected to do. And before I go on to the other folks, I want to add a small piece about um, a program that I was involved in this past year. It had to do with um, looking at our university bookstore. And we decided that it was not serving the needs of the students or the faculty. So we put out, so I was asked to be on that particular RFP development team because of the open ed work 
who knew? Uh, and so I went, I was part of that, and I was really insistent that whatever we did, the, the solution would have to be encouraging open at, uh, educational resources. As part of the portfolio, they could be put into what the authors would pick for their classes, what the faculty would pick. So long story short, we picked Amazon. Most of the students went there anyway. And so we've been working for the past year for them to really start surfacing more open educational materials in their faculty um, selection tool for courses. Uh, on top of that, we had an opportunity to really highlight the work that our circulation and reserves staff do uh, for um, the e-reserves product because they were going to go with a third party vendor for reserves, course packs, like they always had. And I said, this is like double dipping because the library collection has all of this content. <clears throat> this has never been really looked at and it's a way that we can save the students yet more money. So the, uh, some of the people in the administration were like, oh, we're not sure, can the library really support this, really do this, and I said, yes, we can. We, and so I went back and talked with the, with, the, with the staff in that area, and they were all over it. And here's another career trajectory for some of the folks in the library. Just this, the staff often wonder, with these new initiatives that we're engaged in, where do they fit? And this is a really excellent, one really excellent place uh, for them to really pick it up. So one of the people who was responsible for the e-reserve service has since gotten a promotion and he now has an assistant and they're working on, on this, this kind of work. So I'd be glad to talk more about that another time. For uh, working with our IT staff in academic computing, we're working together in partnership with uh, um, the work that we're doing with the Open Textbook Network and getting things started because they often hear from the faculty what their needs are uh, for uh, classroom materials, new textbooks they want to create, those kind of things. So by having a closer connection with them, uh, we can build that up. And now one of the people in the academic computing shop has open education in part of her portfolio. I just feel like we're just kind of going, going out everywhere. <laughs> um, I already mentioned the teaching and learning staff that's in the continuing professional ed, but they also uh, have people on campus who work with us when we do peer review of the grants for our um, faculty, they're, they're engaged with that and they help us and help the faculty work on the course redevelopment and things like um, that kind of flipping their courses over. They've also been involved with faculty who are flipping from um, the, what do they call it, the sage on the stage, the guide on the side and flipping the classroom over to active learning. And so the faculty are really sneaky and the way they are, and um, combine grants from us and from the teaching and learning group and say, we're gonna flip our classroom and we're gonna do OE. So, you know, it's, they get, they're really creative. Uh, so what we're, what we're planning on having then in the end is this culture of engaged faculty um, and staff and the administrators, like I just mentioned with our provost. Um, and then all of this leads to the framework for student success that is one of the three prongs of our university's strategic plan. So, are we saving questions? Yeah. We're saving questions. Thank you. <laughs> all right, great. Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you for stepping in and, and carrying a tremendous presentation uh, for this panel. Um, our next presenter is Meredith Niles. We've had some teasers in other panels uh, leading up to Meredith, so here, here she comes. Uh, Meredith Niles is currently the ass an assistant professor at the University of Vermont, and I do want to encourage everyone to actually read the bios of our three presenters on the full online uh, version of the schedule because um, they really have some fantastic backgrounds and you'll wonder at the end of this how they are doing what they're doing at, that they're speaking about and how they're doing the rest of their work that's happening in their lives. So uh, without further ado, uh, Meredith Niles. I wonder that myself most days, actually. Um, I think mine's up here. Okay. Oh God, Max. This one. Okay, so 
This is going to be a little bit of a historical trip uh, down memory lane and also looking forward. And partly from a professional development standpoint to talk about, I am of a generation of people who have now found themselves as new assistant professors in tenure track positions. So I started at the University of Vermont in August, brand new tenure track position, uh, really exciting, you know, and a lot of us in the room would say, yay, I made it, right? This is the end goal. This is where I should be and how wonderful, how exciting, and it really is. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that happened even while being an open researcher and advocating for open access, but also talk about how now that there's a generation of us entering as new assistant professors with this background, we know about this stuff, but we still have a lot of things to change. And so it's a perspective on, as a new professor, who gets all this stuff? I still think there's big problems, and this is what I think we need to change. So that's why it's titled, I made it here. I made it, I'm here, now how do I do this? Because I ask myself that every day. So to give you some historical trip down memory lane here, um, I'm going to talk about this as a we and then as an I because I think I'm not alone. There's other people in this room who are in the same position as me. Um, and we are a generation of, of organizers and students who've embraced open from the beginning. I don't know anything other than to be an open access researcher. It's not new. You don't have to explain it to me. Uh, you don't have to explain it to anyone in this room. But for a lot of us, we are increasingly what you will see in your new faculty. Um, so this is a picture from several years ago. I'm sort of standing there in the middle, and um, I had the privilege and the absolute joy to be the Director of Legislative Affairs for the US National Association of Graduate and Professional Students. And in that capacity, I organized um, over 120 students in 2013 to come to our Legislative Action Days in Washington, DC, and to lobby and learn about a variety of issues affecting students, not just open access, but student loans was another big issue, um, and student debt, which obviously lends itself well to the OER movement as well. So this is our group of students prior to hitting the hill. And you know we organized and we showed up. And we had a lot of meetings at NAGPS over the years. We continue to. I'm happy to say that one of the students um, in the middle of the bottom left picture, um, bottom right picture, left picture, um, Christopherson Colmer is the current president of the National Association of Graduate Professional Students. He's a graduate student at University of Missouri. That's a picture of all of us sitting in the uh, House Science Committee room after meeting with a bipartisan uh, group of um, members and their staff to talk about science um, and STEM issues. We showed up to legislators all over the country. Um, NAGPS represents 600,000 graduate and professional students all over the US. Um, we are in roughly 40 states. So when we show up to Congress, it's great, because we can talk to basically anybody. Um, and we did, which was really, really exciting. And um, we also built coalitions. Um, so NAGPS uh, worked a lot with other organizations, especially in this room, including Spark. I did my PhD at UC Davis, so I worked a lot with uh, the UC system, the California Student Association. We partnered with PLAS. We partnered with a lot of other groups in California, in particular, to pass one policy I'll talk about uh, especially. But we had an impact, and I think that's one of the most exciting things that you've heard today. OpenCon matters. Before OpenCon, we were doing things too, and OpenCon has just accelerated the pace of the impact that students can have, period. And it will continue to do that. Um, but it was when I was a graduate student in 2013 that we saw the White House Directive. We heard yesterday about how this is moving forward. We actually now have agencies putting these out. We have people that have to comply by these new policies. Um, that happened during my graduate time. We met with pretty important people to talk about this issue. Um, this is a picture of us with the undersecretary of, uh, one of the undersecretaries of the Department of Education at the time to talk about student debt, OER, other open education resources. This is a picture of me with Senator Boxer from California presenting her with our award. Uh, we gave her Legislator of the Year when I was uh, Director of um, Legislative Affairs in part because of her work on student debt in particular, uh, which of course OER is related to. And probably one of my proudest um, 
things I was able to work with a coalition of people to do was to pass AB 609 in California, um, which is the first state level policy in the country to require state level funded research to be made publicly available. Uh, so setting a precedent for that. And we had the governor sign that while I was still a graduate student. Um, thanks in very strong part to Spark and also to PLOS, especially Donna, who's in the room for organizing a lot of that work. And somehow in all of this, we also published tried to get our dissertations done. Uh, we publish open access, right? I mean, this is my first chapter of my dissertation. I'll tell you a little bit more about what I study uh, in a few moments, but I published in PLOS. Um, I've published open access in other journals as well. I love this. Copyright the authors. Isn't that nice? I get to keep it, thank you. <laughs> Me, it's my copyright. So, you know, we've published open access and now we have our own conference. We had the Berlin 11 satellite conference for students in 2013, then we had OpenCon 2014, we had OpenCon 2015, hopefully we'll have OpenCon 2016, uh, and many, many more. Um, and at the end of all of this, amazingly, we actually did graduate. We got our PhDs, some, some are still working on it, and, they're, and I'm clearly very excited. You've seen this face already today. This is my very happy, excited face, like when I gave Rashan the award at OpenCon 2015. I was very excited. And a lot of us um, now are either finishing or um, we went on to do postdocs. So I was um, very lucky to do my postdoctorate work at Harvard in sustainability science and uh, talk about going to an institution that gets it. It was like, oh, great. Nice to meet you, Peter Suber. Let's work together. Um, so that was pretty easy. You know, I show up at Harvard. We do cool things. Uh, this article was published right after I started at Harvard um, where they came out and said, we cannot afford journal publisher prices anymore. So when Harvard says there's a problem, there's probably a problem, right? Because Harvard has the largest endowment in the world. And if they say it's too expensive, it might just be too expensive. Um, and I also expanded some of my, my work and my thinking as a postdoctorate into more of the open data world. Um, so I thought a lot about open research before. But in my postdoctorate, um, I actually used an open data set to conduct all of my postdoctorate work. And I'm still using that open data set. Um, and this is, uh, so my work is in agriculture and climate change and food security. And the CJIR has a program called the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Program. And thankfully, they have decided that, especially for the developing world, to make an impact, all of their data that they collect will be made open. Because that is how they can have the biggest impact. So it allows researchers like myself and like others around the world who can't necessarily afford to go collect all this data themselves to still contribute to helping to analyze it and to understand what it says. Um, so my postdoctorate work was looking at the effect of climate change and climate shocks on 15 countries across the developing world, in particular with smallholder farmers. And um, I'm very proud to say it was also at this time that I was appointed to the board of directors for PLOS, um, the Public Library of Science. So PLOS was one of the first um, large OA organizations to say we should have early career researchers on our board. And I'm thrilled to have an appointment on that board from 2014 to 2018. And really excited for all of the ex interesting new things that are coming, trust me. So, this is a little bit of the journey, and this is where a lot of us are at this point. You know, we've, we've been researchers mostly only knowing how to do open access research. We know what it is, we've lobbied for it, we've passed laws, we've published in it, we've used open data, we create open code. Um, and so as Mike Eisen would say, as he did at, at OpenCon 2015 this year, we wore open on our sleeves. And that was sort of his message in the keynote at OpenCon 2015 um, was, wear open on your sleeves, don't hide it. And I never hid it, and I used it a lot, actually, in my interviews, my job talks. I've given talks at Harvard to my fellow colleagues about how to become open access, how to use it um, in your career, how to not hide from it, because it is an asset. And so I've, I've given these um, talks. And so, you know, now, we made it, right? People like me are all of a sudden new tenure track faculty and work is over, right? Problem solved. Let's go home. There's a tidal wave of us coming, guys. It's okay, don't worry. We're gonna show up. So problem solved, right? We can just, yay, yay good job. Well, maybe, right? Um, or 
Maybe increasingly what I've realized now that I'm in that tenure track position is that things change and priorities change. And so I wanna talk a little bit about now that I'm a professor, uh, <laughs> what has changed for me and what do I think about that I didn't think about before and why I think it's especially important for librarians and others in the institution to reflect on this as well. Um, so I'm gonna focus on three things, um, teaching, tenure, and I tried to think of another T word, but I couldn't really figure it out. So being a next generation scientist and researcher, what does that mean? So on teaching. So what does every new professor have to do? Teach a lot, that's for sure. Develop courses, Develop courses right? It's in the syllabus. I want to tell my students that all the time, of course. But this was something I had not really thought about before. So I taught for two years at UC Davis, where I did my PhD, um, but I co-taught that class. I wasn't a teaching assistant. I was an associate instructor, but with a full-time faculty member, we co-taught the class. And so the syllabus was sort of already there, you know, and I think this is common. A lot of students don't even get the opportunity to co-teach a class. They're often just the teaching assistant, right? So they take the syllabus that's given to them, and they have to deal with it. And then we show up in a faculty position and we have to develop often brand new courses. I've developed two brand new courses since I started at UVM, one in food policy and one in food system science and policy. And this is a fantastic time to actually talk to new faculty about OER because as someone who's lived and breathed open access my entire time as a scientist, I found myself all of a sudden asking these questions. And of course, I knew I could call Nicole at any given time, but how do I even create these materials? Where do I start? Who's gonna give me the funding to do so? You know, it's amazing to hear about what UMass Amherst is doing because that's exactly what we need. I can't just write a textbook for the fun of it, right? I mean, we need resources, we need time. We have to have programs in place to make that happen. How do I find open lesson plans? There's a couple of sites out there. Can I use an open textbook? Is there even one for my field? How do I talk to my students about open access? Which is very different than talking to a policymaker about open access or some of the other people um, I've worked with in the past. So I've done a few things, but certainly I think there's a lot more work to be done. So one of the things I did um, this past year was I applied for a workshop at the um, National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, which is an NSF-funded center run by the University of Maryland. And uh, this is for people like myself who work on social ecological problems. And it was to develop case studies to teach social ecological systems. And as a group, our class decided that these would all be under a CC license. So I developed an open case study that will be um, put onto the CSYNC website, as well all of their future cases as well, which will all also have a CC license. And mine in particular was on looking at how do you control nutrients in dairy um, and increasing demand for milk and meat, and how do we sort of balance the demand for these products with the environmental impact they might have and getting students to think across different disciplines. Um, I also tried to use a lot of open access articles in my syllabus. Certainly didn't have my students purchase a $400 textbook, um, but as I will talk about, because I am in an emerging field and as a multidisciplinary scientist, it is very hard to find open educational resources for those groups of people. So it's challenging. Um, and I do talk to my students about open access. I just stole a whole bunch of PLOS pens to give them when I go back. So it'll spur the conversation. Um, but we need help. And I think there's a huge opportunity for new faculty to be educated about open educational materials and open resources. And as Marilyn just showed, 65% of the faculty, I think that was at your institution before you started, but they don't even know what these are. And I knew what they were, but I didn't know how to find them, I didn't know how to use them, I didn't know how I could get resources to develop them. And so if you could start doing things like developing workshops for new faculty, presenting at new faculty orientation. We are like the most captive audience ever at new faculty orientation. We literally cannot leave. We're afraid to like <laughs> leave. We can't go anywhere. Um, and everyone from all over campus is there. And we're all terrified that if we do something wrong, we won't get our tenure sheets right or something. So 
New faculty orientation is a great time to talk about what OER resources exist. And we also are terrified to develop our new syllabi. We don't know how to do it. We've never really had to do it. So if you could provide resources at new faculty orientation or a workshop um, when we first start, I think it would be a great way to help new faculty understand what is available for them. And once they build that into their syllabus, that's going to continue. I mean, that's the important thing about working with new faculty, is that now that I've developed two syllabi, it's going to be a lot harder to change those syllabi down the road than to just create them to be open from the beginning. So trying to work with new faculty early on, I think, will be really important. So the second thing I want to talk about is tenure. So I am in a tenure track position. Um, I am reviewed every two years. And I just started, so I have to submit all my paperwork um, for my first tenure review in October. And I really like history. I don't teach history, but I read a lot of history, presidential biographies. So I, I know the sort of general history of tenure. It's you know, a long time in the, in the making, and it's been there for a long time. But in the US, one of the first declarations about tenure was from the American, from the AAUP. Uh, in 1915. And this 1915 Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure is really interesting because it says this about the function of the academic institution, which is the importance of academic freedom <clears throat> is most clearly perceived in the light of the purposes for which universities exist. These are three in number. To promote inquiry and advance the sum of human knowledge, to provide general instruction to the students, and to develop experts for various branches of the public service. So this is over 100 years ago. And I want to focus on that one in particular, right? To promote inquiry and advance the sum of human knowledge. This is one of the central tenets as to why universities exist, right? But the ways in which we promote inquiry and advance the sum of human knowledge is fundamentally different today than it was 100 years ago. And so what I'm not saying is that I want a free pass. I'm not saying that I should just get tenure. My generation is not saying we should just get tenure. We know we have to work hard for it. And I know that I have to contribute um, and demonstrate that I am a scientist and a researcher just the way that everybody else has before. But what we should be able to say is that the ways that we contribute are different now. And we should reward and acknowledge all ways in which people contribute to promoting inquiry and advancing the sum of human knowledge. And so as I think about tenure, I think we need to think about how do we create systems that acknowledge all research outputs. I've heard stories, as probably many of you had, uh, have, about literally people publishing work in an open access journal um, that hasn't counted for a tenure review, or actually disappears because that journal doesn't have an impact factor, for example. Um, this is real things that are happening. We're writing code, we're writing date, you know, we're writing new forms of knowledge that could be part of a tenure and promotion package and should be considered. And we need the space in our forms and the physical places to actually include these outputs um, to be considered as part of the package as well. So I think we need to think about how do we create those systems or change the existing systems, but also to showcase the other ways that our work is advancing human knowledge that maybe just hasn't been possible before when these original ideas about tenure um, were created. And I think that librarians can really help to lead that charge, to demonstrate that a lot of products beyond just publishing in a traditional journal are really important to advance knowledge and really important to promote inquiry. And you all know what these are, and to make sure that people within your institutions um, understand how they're contributing, and to the extent that you can showcase professors and students and other academics who are using these things, I think is incredibly important. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit just about next generation researchers, because I think this will be really important for librarians and institutions to think about increasingly, as well as for this broader movement. So this is a question I get asked a lot, right? Every interview, when you're interviewing for postdocs and faculty positions, well, how do you describe yourself? Or what kind of scientist are you? They want you to say you're a social scientist, or you're a biologist, or whatever. Let me tell you about all of the various things that I could use to describe myself. So I have an undergraduate degree in political science. I did my PhD in ecology. My focus is in agriculture. 
But I focus on the human side of agriculture. So why do people, especially farmers, change their behavior and make decisions about environmental issues, especially climate change? I did a postdoctorate in sustainability science. I now teach in a food systems program, and I'm in a department of nutrition and food sciences. This is increasingly common. Uh, I am not necessarily an anomaly. And actually, the National Science Foundation, in their survey of earned doctorates in 2014, found that 55% of all doctorate recipients had a master's degree uh, in a related field, which means 45% of them didn't. And uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. 55% of all doctorate recipients, yes, had a master's degree in a related field, but only 34% in the life sciences said so. So they're getting a PhD in the life sciences, but they didn't do a master's and possibly an undergraduate in a life sciences field. And the same um, is broadly true in the physical sciences as well. So increasingly, we see people like myself who actually are fundamentally multidisciplinary. I don't know how to be anything other than a multidisciplinary scientist. And that's in part because of programs like the IGERT, for example, right? The National Science Foundation had a huge program on IGERT. I was an IGERT fellow at Davis for two years. They think, they teach us to think that way. They train us to be multidisciplinary. And so this means a lot, I think, for what a future generation of both students as well as faculty members um, will be, because we are increasingly multidisciplinary. And actually, our programs are also increasingly multidisciplinary. So <clears throat> this is data, thank you to my institution for this. So I teach in a food systems program. So University of Vermont has the only PhD program in the country in food systems. We, our master's program is four years old, and our undergraduate degree is about to be approved and will start in September. And this is data from other uh, institutions, undergraduate programs in the US in food systems, which is an incredibly multidisciplinary field. We have faculty, 50 faculty all over campus in every department ranging from English and philosophy to the medical school. And what you see here is that the enrollment in food system programs around the US is massively increasing. And there's other kinds of programs like this that are also um, becoming more and more common. And in my opinion, we need to think about evolving open access to reflect this. Um, so for example, I love the open textbook library at the University of Minnesota. I frequently tell people about it. When I go there to look up food-related textbooks that I might use in my class, these are the only two entries that come up. One is a textbook for chemistry, and the other is a textbook on native people. And I can't use either one of those open textbooks, which is why I'd like to write one, but I need the resources and I can't find them, so yeah. <laughs> but my point is that we need to start thinking about, we've done fantastic work to develop OER, I think often for these large disciplinary classes, the intro to physics, the intro to bio, all of those kinds of classes. They have a huge impact in terms of the number of students that we can reach, but as we start to evolve, what OER looks like and what new faculty and students are interested in, um, we have to think about emerging fields and we have to think about multidisciplinary fields. And we need librarians who can work across disciplines. Um, so we need people who can work with people in a food systems program like mine, who might have training in multiple areas themselves and not just be one type of librarian for one type of program or one type of college, because increasingly people are more and more transdisciplinary. And I would also argue that um, we might need some more journals that reflect this as well. A lot of the really well-known open access journals are still very much in the biophysical sciences and the medical sciences, though that is fantastically changing. So um, moving forward, you know, things continue to change. And, but I think change is good, right? And I think increasingly we will see new faculty coming into your institutions who broadly do understand what this stuff is, but we still need help to figure out how to use it in our classrooms and how to develop syllabi and how to work with students. Um, so we may know some of the basics, but we still haven't implemented a lot of them yet. Um, and so that means we still have a lot of work to do. So thank you very much, and I look forward to questions later. All right, thank you, Meredith. Um, our next speaker is going to do a quick computer change, um, so there might be a minute of delay. 
Um, our next speaker is Alberto, Alberto Pepe. He is the co-founder of Authoria. Um, so this is going to be a fantastic kind of transition to our last speaker because, again, it's going to give you an idea of how different um, folks' careers have progressed who are involved in open. So um, as soon as this is plugged in, we'll take it away. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pretty excited to uh, be speaking at a conference uh, where the topic, uh, the main topic is openness, because that's what really excites me the most. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background. I'm a scientist as well. My background is in astrophysics and computer science. And just to give you an idea of like how I got involved in the, uh, in the open access and open science uh, business is that uh, after my uh, uh, bachelor uh, degree in science, I worked at CERN, and I was actually one of the first people in the um, task force for open access that was run by uh, CERN. So I was doing my uh, physics work, a bunch of data analysis, but I was also working very closely with the library, promoting open access among particle physicists. Um, in fact, I got so interested in the world of uh, open access that I decided to do a PhD in information science. So I took a break from uh, astrophysics research and physics research, and uh, I did a, actually my PhD uh, was in information science at UCLA with Kristen Borgman, uh, who's also very active in the library and uh, uh, data sharing and the information science community. I then went back to astrophysics uh, for a postdoc at Harvard, and I actually had a lot of the problems that you were, dis is the uh, sound okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I had a lot of problems with, uh, you know, the things that you were talking about in terms of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, research. Um, but then, um, I'm just going to give you a talk, so I have a few slides, uh, about 10 slides, and then I'm going to give you a little demo of the platform that I built over the last uh, couple of years. So if you've seen a talk uh, uh, by myself in the past, you've probably seen this slide. I always tend to uh, start talks with, uh, with this slide over here, which tries to outline all my motivation for, uh, you know, all the motivations that I have for my work. So what I end up saying is that as, um, uh, as a scientist, I've been very close to a large scale scientific collaborations. I know how most researchers and scientists work. My dissertation was actually on scientific collaboration networks. Um, so by definition, science is 21st century research. It's cutting edge, it's novel, it's new. But if you look at the tools that most researchers use uh, to write up research, they were uh, essentially built in the 1980s and intended to be used by a single person working offline. And the problem there is that now we work online and most of the time we work in large scale collaborations. Um, what really makes me mad is that we're still packaging research in a format that looks very much like uh, the papers that we were publishing 400 years ago. And actually, um, the good thing here is that I am myself an astrophysicist, so one of the, the first papers published in science was by actually an Italian guy as well, Galileo. Uh, he, um, he was a scientist, but also I would say a startup entrepreneur. Uh, he uh, raised some money from the Medici family, uh, which you can see on the main page of the, of the paper, and uh, um, he was working in his backyard using his telescope. He collected a, a lot of data about uh, the moons that he saw around orbiting Jupiter, and he made some uh, groundbreaking uh, um, observations about the world we live in. You know, it's not a uh, geocentric universe, but we live in a heliocentric solar system. So this was groundbreaking, and it's the first time that anybody published research. Uh, and it was almost like self-publishing, right? And the best way for Galileo to like s spread his ideas was to really like print them on paper and disseminate them, of course, with the help of the Medici family in that case. Um, so I've been mentioning this paper for a long time now, and every time I talk about this paper, I'm like, look, you know, we're still publishing papers in the same format. Why don't we take advantage of the web? And then my uh, postdoc advisor at Harvard, Alyssa Goodman, once told me, have you actually looked inside the paper? Like, what's happening inside the paper? So I was like, well, I actually have to read this paper. So I did. Uh, this is an English translation. And if you look at it, what's, what I find really fascinating is that, first of all, it's got a very narrative account. So Galileo is telling you step by step what he's doing uh, in, in his research. You know, there's a lot of metadata in there. Um, and then he's publishing these drawings. And you're like, whoa. Uh, what's happening. So the only data that he collected were actual drawings because there was no photography. He was looking through the telescope 
and you know, essentially drawing what he was seeing, and then he published everything that he collected. So if you think about it, he was actually um, publishing his annotated notebook. So they would allow every, every other researcher or the general public to reproduce uh, his study. Um, now, the problem today is that, of course, data has become really large. It doesn't fit in a paper anymore, but we're still publishing papers, which are papers that are, you know, look a little bit like that. So my question is, if there was a, a young hipster version of Galileo, and he had to like rethink entirely uh, academic publishing and scientific dissemination, what would he do? Um, so I think that um, including data in papers as just links is not good enough. It's just not going to work. And actually, I know this because I did a little study myself with uh, some uh, colleagues at Harvard a couple of years ago. Uh, this was actually published in PLOS. Um, and if you look, these are the number of links in um, astronomical literature over time. So we actually analyzed every single astronomical paper uh, published in the, this 10-year time span. And we looked at the number of links. As you can see, they increase over time. Uh, and then we looked, we actually tried to resolve those links to see if they're still uh, valid. And as it turns out, if you wait four or five years, about half of the links that you have in papers don't resolve to anything anymore. They're broken. So that's a problem. Just a link in a paper is not saying, oh, I'm sharing my data, this, you know, doing open data and open science. Um, but in the process of uh, thinking about, you know, the new version, like what the, a new type of scholarly paper looks like, uh, we also came across other problems around uh, collaboration, for example. Uh, if, if you've written research papers, you've probably received emails like that, you know, edits underscore version 2.1 underscore final, 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 final. <laughs> you have to count the number of finals that you get. So what happens is that if you're the, uh, the, the main author, you end up with five different, you know, ten different versions that then you have to like merge and, uh, you know, uh, bring into like one single uh, manuscript. Um, so we are big fans uh, at Authoria. One of the reasons why we built Authoria in a certain way is that we were inspired by Git and version control in general. So if you don't know what Git is, it's like track changes, but for anything. Uh, and uh, it's used a lot for source code. Uh, we use it to um, track documents. And I think it's a fantastic way to repurpose a very robust uh, version control uh, system. And here the idea is that um, you know, if you're working with a lot of people, most of the time you don't even know what they're doing to the paper. If track changes is not on, you end up, you know, with a paper. You actually, it's happened to me. I published a paper where I noticed that one of the graduate students I was working with when I was a postdoc actually introduced some language that I actually didn't want to, you know, to, uh, to be in the final um, manuscript, but, you know, it wasn't there. So we need very strong version control. Um, so, uh, we're also huge fans of really uh, trying to give authors credit for you know, their open work and for uh, data sharing. So for example, this is a, um, an example of a, an Authoria profile page for Marie Curie. Of course, it's a fictional uh, uh, profile on Authoria. And we developed you know, things like the Open Science Index and the Collaborative Open Science Index. What we're trying to do is we're you know, very simply trying to measure how many of my papers that I'm writing are public, are open. And if that can be an incentive, even a small, tiny incentive for people to publish their stuff and you know, put their stuff in the open, well then you know, we're pushing in that direction, which is, uh, which is great, and we're encouraging openness. Um, then we're also all about speeding up, of course, the pace of uh, uh, writing and publication. You've probably seen this, which is great. Um, <laughs> Now, a lot of people complain about, a lot of people complain about <laughs> publishing times being very long, but it turns out that also writing a paper takes a long time. If you have to you know, exchange back and forth a manuscript and uh, wait for the you know, second author that is like on vacation, and by the time he comes back, the third author is on vacation, and it's really hard to uh, you know, really collaborate and uh, you know, do, it, do so in a, you know, in a more efficient and uh, fast way. Um, well, there's some publishers in the room, so I don't want to be uh, too revolutionary, but we're also interested in really like trying to play with ideas on how 
academic publishing can change. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, famous tweets uh, from, you know, we don't have too many followers, but, you know, feel free to follow us on Twitter. Um, right after the mutiny and Elsevier that you're probably familiar with, you know, we tweeted, uh, tweeted this little post that says, you know, it really, why is, is there a mutiny? Because, you know, Elsevier failed to embrace open access. And then uh, we posted this very great uh, quote by a scientist that is explaining uh, what the problem is. Actually, one astronomer that I work with said, you guys just tweeted everything that is wrong with academic publishing in one tweet. Uh, and I'm not an economist. I'm not going to go ahead and read you the, uh, the quote. Uh, but it seems like there, you know, from a, uh, a performance efficiency and from an economic perspective, academic publishing as an industry clearly needs to uh, needs to change. So what I'm going to do, how much, how long do I have? Like five minutes? Have time, yeah? yeah. OK, so I'm going to, I like risk, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a demo. I know that uh, most times it just fails, but you know, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you anyway. So um, this is the home page. So I'm going to show you like, what we've done with, uh, with Authoria. And uh, you know, as I go along, I'm going to touch on some of the points and issues that we've tried to solve around openness about uh, uh, scientific collaboration. Um, so that's the home page. If you actually look at the um, top, there's a browse button where you can actually browse articles that have been authored on Authoria. We have around 2,000 articles that are public, so you can actually take a look at what people are writing or have written. Here at the top are um, some papers that we have featured because they're uh, great stuff. We have great papers on epidemiology, climate science, astrophysics, high energy physics. This paper actually has 200 authors, so it's really an example of how large scale collaborations work. Um, and then if you actually scroll down, you'll see some papers that are, are being authored right now. So this one, for example, less than a minute ago, uh, and then this one two minutes ago, open access policies in Italy. So it's fantastic. Um, and uh, if you just go down, you actually see that there's some Homework, people are just writing homework, uh, problem sets, and then you know, having their students uh, do the homework uh, on Authority as well, which is great. Uh, and if you go down, you'll see some like astronomy research and some, some more uh, climate, um, climate science and so on. But what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to show you what the platform looks like and what it does. And um, so this is my homepage. Uh, if I go to my homepage, it's got a profile picture of me with uh, short hair and the three affiliations that I'm. Uh, affiliated with. Uh, these are the documents that I'm working on, this stuff over here. And then there's some very basic profile information about myself and the stats. These are the same stats that I showed you before. So the, you know, for example, in my case, 72% of my Authoria papers are public. So I'm a pretty strong, you know, open science uh, guy. Um, the way to interact with Authoria is to really start uh, a new article. And I'm going to call this article, I'm going to give it a title, Spark Live Demo. Um, create a new article and what you get is just a blank page where you can start immediately writing. Um, it's an editor, so I can write anything I want. And it's also a rich text, what you see is what you get. So I can, you know, I can say I can bold uh, something and let's see if it works, italic something. Well, I'm just going to stop there. because. Uh, as you can see, you have a toolbar at the top, so you can you know, play with the different uh, things we have. The important thing here is that there's no knowledge of LaTeX or Markdown or MediaWiki. You can just write as you're writing a blog post. I think I have saved some text in my uh, clipboard. No, I haven't. Uh, let me just find it here. Sorry. Uh, oh, there you go. OK, so the, the paper actually looks a little more like it's a, it's a real paper. So here we go. Now we have some more text. And I want to show you like what the uh, actual power of the you know editor is and some of the ideas that you know around scholarship around collaboration and around openness so at this point for example if I want to cite a paper by uh, Meredith all I do is I just click cite and I look for Meredith and I search uh, crossref and I see that uh, we have some papers, uh, papers. yeah <laughs> your papers yeah this one is the, the one plus one that I think you mentioned before I just hit cite and what this does is creates a citation, then I hit save and it creates a reference as well. And they're, they're linked as you can see. Um, we use Crossref to actually provide this fantastic service that allows people to you know, cite and do referencing uh, while they're writing, which I think is fundamental. Uh, you can also cite by, you know, I can search for Ebola papers in 
around Sierra Leone, for example. And we have PubMed for medical literature. So there's, I don't know, paper right here, for example. Just gonna cite that one. And once again, when I hit save, the citation and the reference gets created. Uh, we also have, in case you're interested, an equation editor. Uh, you can, I'm going to write the most boring equation in the world. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, you can do more complex stuff and, you know, uh, really play with, the, uh, with, with equations. Uh, you can comment on anything at all. So I can just highlight some text here. And I just, oh, hang on a sec. Uh, highlight some text. Oh, the screen is smaller, so some comments. Okay, there you go. So I can just comment on something, and you can allow other people to comment. You can uh, gather reviews that way, and so on. Um, now, the interesting part, getting to the actual, you know, the more open science-y side of things, is that you can insert a figure, for example. I'm just going to insert a, uh, uh, this figure over here that I have on my desktop, and it looks like a, a, the screen is actually making the, the whole thing look a little weird. And sorry about that. So I have the figure. Now it's my, I have a figure in my paper. Now I can attach data. So what I was saying before is that data should not exist as links, but it should actually exist within the paper. That's what I'm doing here. I can attach data to the figure, and I have, I think, a CSV file that I have here that relates to the figure. And in addition to that, I don't know how familiar you are with the Jupyter and IPython notebooks, but you can also attach a notebook, like an IPython notebook. I'm going to do that right here. I think I have it right there. So um, I'm going to launch the IPython in the background, but before I do that, I want to show you that Every single paper has a folder view. So essentially, a paper is not just a PDF or you know, text and images. It's actual files. So I can go to the folder view, and I can see these are all the files that are rendered in my, in my thing. There's the bibliography. If I go to the bibliography, I can actually download the, you know, and play with the bibliography itself. Uh, let me just go back here. Um, if I go to the figures folder, I can actually display all the different, you know, all the, the figures and the data for those figures. And of course, this is not working, which is the beauty of doing a demo. OK, there you go. OK, there we go, the figure. And I actually have the figure with the JPEG, the CSV, and also the IPython notebook. In addition to just dropping the IPython notebook, we also allow you and all the readers to launch the IPython notebook. So in this case, this is all the script in Python that I wrote to produce that image. So they re really like trying to play with the idea of, uh, you know, Galileo sharing every single thing that he has, all the data, all the code, all the workflows associated with the paper are in here. And uh, I think the last thing I want to show you is also that um, we have a, a very, you know, we're built on Git. Now, this is a very granular, probably too much information, but every single change that I made to the paper is now logged here. Um, the very last thing I'm going to show you, sorry, uh, is that. Um, of course, a lot of people, you know, when they're writing on the web, they also need a PDF at the end of the day. Um, what we do here is that we really separate for format from content. So if you need a PDF, you just uh, pick your style. In this case, let's just say that we want to send it to uh, uh, Elsevier. So we just create an Elsevier preprint. And I'm just going to hit PDF. <laughs> so in one click, just give it a second, we're able to, um, to create a, uh, a PDF on the fly. So there's like, it's like Instagram filters for papers in a way, you know? <laughs> um, so here's the PDF, and it's formatted according to Elsevier with all the citations, of course, in Elsevier style. But if Elsevier rejects the paper, which is possible, you go back to export and uh, you format it for, uh, should we go for what? Frontiers or maybe Springer? Let's go for Springer. And, you know, PDF, and you just get it formatted in uh, Springer style. Uh, so that's about it. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a healthy amount of time left for questions. We are an efficient group, so thank you for the efficiency plug there, Alberto, in your, in your presentation. So um, questions away. If not, I have one to get started. Hi, I'm Jody Bailey, um, Director of Publishing at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're just getting started with the open access digital publishing, and uh, we really want to hire an open education librarian, Marilyn. <laughs> and, um, we're having some trouble recruiting, so can you give us any advice about um, 
how to find people who are interested in this kind of work or uh, what you did? Um, so what I did was uh, start up the program and start training some people in the library and uh, then created a job description that fit what I was training the person to be able to do. And that particular person, yes, I hired from within. Right now, I have a um, graduate student from a local gra uh, library school program. He's with us for a semester learning all about open education. So he'll be done, what, in May, June, August? I forget when he's, when he's uh, graduating. But he's actually, as part of his internship, he's starting up a program at another institution. So yeah. There's a lot of need for training people in how to go about doing this. I, I have an idea as well. It's called OpenCon. We have a, yeah, we have a lot of um, people in the community at OpenCon who are in the information sciences and libraries, and so they're coming and they're looking for jobs. So I bet if you write one, you might get some really good applications, yeah. and we could probably send it out on the OpenCon listserv. Too. Yeah, I was going to say, that where are you? Whoops. Where you advertise is going to make a difference. Cause so if you're advertising in traditional places, you're not going to find them. They're, they're just not looking there. Thank you. Hi, Joyce Ogburn, Dean of Libraries at Appalachian State University. I'd like to challenge OpenCon to write the promotion and tenure guidelines you'd like to see us mm -hmm. adopt in our universities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think yeah. Because it's you who have to be judged by those, and often we settle for what we're told we have to do, and I think we should put a stake in the ground and say, this is the future of scholarship, this is what we want to do. I'd be happy to work with you on that. Thank you for that. Uh, there is a group of us that developed off of OpenCon who are meeting here as well. One of the things that we need to do is to actually see what's out there, because we recognize that we're not going to create a one-size-fits-all but we need examples of best practices and we need to know what people have at different institutions. So I think the first step for us is to do our research and figure out what does it look like at different places and then how can we pull best practice examples together. So we'd love to work with you and anyone else. Thank you. Can I, can, can I make a comment about that as well? Um, because when we've been doing our open access policy education over the course of the last year or so, we've gone to some promotion and tenure groups in the various mm -hmm. academic departments, talked about open access, the impact factor, altmetrics, and all those kind of things, and tried to get a sense from a variety of academic departments how they judge materials that are put in open access, journals, and um, alternative research like um, things that are put up on the web instead of traditional published monographs or things. And they're telling us, they're telling the library, that they look at the scholarship, they make sure that it's high quality and that it's being reviewed by high profile people in the field and they don't care if it's open access or not. They're looking for the high quality, high peer review criteria. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a best practice. <laughs> Yeah, so, Meredith, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on, so I'm sort of in a similar position as you are, as you know, um, and I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about your experience of, did you ha have you had moments in which you start questioning your practices around, should I be, is this going to be valued, should I be doing this, and even if you haven't changed them, do you, has it made you question a little bit whether or not you can practice what you've been preaching all this time, and whether, or whether you think that's going to have a negative impact on your career. Mm -hmm. So if you could yeah, comment on if you've had that sort of internal tension. Mm -hmm. um, not really, <laughs> to be honest. Um, because I, I wanted to be, in, in part, first of all, at a land-grant institution, because I think being an open access researcher is, should be fully embraced by the land grant system. Um, I feel like what I do is in line with the mission of land grant institutions. So I only applied to jobs at land grant institutions on purpose um, because I see open access as fulfilling the real mission of the land grant institutions. So in that context, I don't question it at all um, because I think there's a way to talk about it as fulfilling what ultimately I should be doing, which is providing resources and assistance and help and work for the people of Vermont um, or California, you know, wherever it was um, that you have a land-grant institution. But uh, it's definitely, 
It's definitely interesting, right? I mean, as a student, you don't think about all of these implications long term. But for me, and I stand by everything I've ever said before, which is that open access is an asset. And I I've, I've see it as an asset in terms of your career. Um, and I think there are ways to talk about it, not just in terms of where you publish, but what it really means to embody being an open access researcher, which to me is collaboration and working across disciplines, and that is how we advance science. And so I think it's taking the whole package of what being an open access researcher looks like, not just one component, and when you take that whole package, it means you're fundamentally pushing the frontiers of science and research, in my opinion. I mean, so that's I mean, great to, to, yeah, I think there's also the element of uh, not just the where you publish around being sort of doing things in open access or doing things with an open science mentality, but also the kinds of work that you do, right? So you were doing a lot of advocacy and political uh, work before, and that's work that is definitely not anywhere on your tenure promotion form, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, I was doing, I've been spending, you know, 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week doing yeah. sort yeah. of political advocacy. And yeah. to what extent, you know, do you have you felt like, oh, I can't do those kinds of things anymore because that's, those are not formally part of my job description? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not part of my job description, so that's true. It's my spring break right now, I'm here. Uh, so a lot of those things aren't happening on my university time. Um, so that's definitely true. I mean, I certainly think there's a level of extra work that all of us are doing that isn't on our university time because we care about this stuff. So I know that's not in my, in my RPT package, but you know, outreach to the community is, and um, working, you know, I don't have an extension appointment, but I'm funded in part by extension money because I'm in an agriculture school. So I work a lot with farmers, and farmers want research, and I'm thrilled that the USDA finally passed a, you know, a public access policy because that's half the reason I started in this journey was the farmers I worked with couldn't get access to the journals and to the information. So um, I think it, it, I agree, you know, like I'm not going to say that I'm getting uh, all of the um, time I need to do all of these extra things, but none of us are, right? And we do it because we care and we're passionate. So um, I think that continues. Hi, I'm Lauren Collister, scholarly communication librarian, University of Pittsburgh, and also an early career researcher in the field of linguistics. Um, I was really inspired, Meredith, by your idea that there's this wave of researchers coming who have grown up in scholarship with open on their sleeves, and the idea that it's not so simple, um, to, that this is just going to be the change that we need. My thought is that also many of us who are scholars who have grown up in an open community are, are also going to the library. Um, I don't have a library background. I work as a librarian right now. And it's been an interesting experience, to say the least. And so this is a thought for everybody in the room as well as our panel. But what is the role of folks like that? How can we take advantage of this expertise outside of a library beyond um, MLIS? And how can we help, inter help that interface happen between people like the researchers, the faculty, who have uh, been in this open environment, and the librarians who've also been in the open environment, how can we better that interface? I sometimes feel there's a bit of a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, oh, I feel like interesting. Could talk about That's that. really interesting. I actually, I actually asked Emma this last night at the reception. I was like, Emma, I don't understand. When am I allowed to contact you guys? Like, what is the, what is the, you know, like when can I email the library and tell them I need something or I need help? Or I actually like didn't, I don't really know what that looks like. You know, I started at this new institution and thankfully the librarian for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Vermont is a graduate of the food systems program I teach in. So I had an immediate connection to her, but I'm, I don't quite know like when can I reach out or like when should you be reaching out? It's like this weird like dating situation <laughs> yes, it feels like. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know well, if others have thoughts on that, but I agree it's a, it's a thing I because I felt like I needed resources. I didn't know where to find them and I didn't want to bother people and wow. so I don't know. Maybe so don't we do participate in the new faculty orientation and we are part of a, you know, a whole group of people that go and, and speak with the faculty when they first come to the university and share with them the business cards of their particular person so they do know who to contact in the library as soon as they have a minute. <clears throat> we also, excuse me, reach out to new faculty or transferring in faculty on, uh, as 
basically within the first month after they've come to make sure that they are welcome to come to the library and explain again the services that we offer. What we need to do is follow up with them the next semester because they are so not the first semester just getting used to being there and I really think that what we're giving them for information goes somewhere else. And it's like the either the next semester or the next year that we need to be doing some significant follow up with these folks. That said, um, the little piece that I mentioned in my talk about the uh, changing role of liaison librarians and uh, we're working on actively embedding ourselves in faculty research groups. Um, especially because of the, di the data management plans that are needed, um, how they go about publishing in new venues, copyright, fair use, open access. All this semester we've been going around to a variety of uh, academic departments and we have had no trouble, believe it or not, no trouble getting onto the academic department's faculty meeting agenda for 10 minutes. Then they know who we are, they see who we are, and they, get ex they do get excited about this. So those are just a couple of things. Yeah, and I would totally echo that like, follow up because we were so new faculty orientation, your brain is gonna explode. And then not only are you, is your brain gonna explode, you're thinking and they show you your green sheets for the first time about what it actually takes to get tenure, and then you just mostly wanna cry. And so it's very overwhelming. Um, so I think that following up would be you know, first contact. And I would say specifically, talk about OER because our library was there at New Faculty Orientation. I did know who they were. They gave us their cards. But let them know, especially for that whole syllabus development mm -hmm. component, mm -hmm. we're here. We can really help you with OER. I, I think, and then to continue to follow up would be really helpful. I would just like to say thank you to all of our panelists. And Alberto, um, your uh, describing scholarly work as still kind of being stuck in the realm of what Galileo was doing. I think that also goes for internal university communication. Uh, so if we could really get that in the 21st century, um, at least at my institution. Um, but thank you to all of the panelists. Um, please join me in thanking them again. Um, thank you very much.